Hey YouTube, Mr. Terry back once again to check out another history video. Today we're watching Oversimplified's Three Kingdoms. Um, haven't seen this, uh, just came out just a few days ago I believe. Um, probably going to be talking about ancient China, um, which is great because I love learning about ancient China and there's a lot of uh, interesting mystery and a lot of conflict, um, especially in the early years before really the China that we know it really came to be. And I'm sure they'll get in. Uh, they'll get into that. All right. I'll make sure to put a link to the original video so that if you like it, you can go over to them. Um, if you have not given them just a like, subscribe, but even just the view is always great to make sure that they get credit for that because these people do such good work. So let's go ahead and get started uh, with the video right now. This video was made possible by Total War Three Kingdoms, the brand new strategy game from the multi-award winning Total. Oh, War looks like they teamed up. Support my channel by using the link in the video game. Down below Makes sense, right? Buy the game on Make Steam. an historical video also, game. New get a popular in the store, including a mystery uh, new character pin. Video or history company that makes videos to ancient China. Team up. The sun is shining. The birds are singing. BC. The children are playing in the village square. What a wonderful time to be alive! Hey, the Yellow River flooded again and yep. destroyed all your crops. And also we're being raided by nomadic tribesmen. That's basically Chinese so history summed up Chinese right there. This history may be entirely mythical, meaning you may not even exist. Well, that would certainly explain the laser eyes. <laughs> Chinese civilization began around the year 2000 BC when the possibly mythical Xia dynasty yeah. was formed. Throughout China's history, dynasties would usually... Talked about in my classes, the, the Xia dynasty. Read, um, China's a big part of... Uh, the history classes that I teach and what gets assessed and um, one of the things they we, we try to get is to know the dynasties and we, we always have a debate about the Shah because it's kind of like it may or may not have existed um, I think what we know about them mostly comes from the Shang who took them over and that can always be a um, touchy part of history and all you have is from people commenting on later especially if they're the ones that took them over um so they'll probably what you see in that uh in those scenarios often histories they'll talk very poorly about the people that they conquered because it makes you look better and that's a big part of the uh chinese dynastic cycle which we'll see if they go into is a way to justify overthrowing the previous people you got to make them look bad and then it makes you look good by default so it looks like they you start off that with that very very quickly here in china with the earliest of the dynasties rise up with a powerful leader who worked for the good of the people but over time the leaders would become more corrupt and self-serving someone would inevitably build a lake of alcohol and the angry populace would overthrow them giving way for a new dynasty to rise following this pattern the Shai dynasty very was common replaced story by the Shai, who liked bronze and writing but then the leaders got corrupt and were replaced by the Zhou who liked the iron and philosophy i think it's so cool let me get a pause who liked bronze and writing right there okay so uh, the writing in early Chinese history, they would write on the writing that we have that we call them on, on, on uh, or oracle bones. Sorry, um, oracle bones. And the earliest writing in China are these things where they would write, probably like their shaman um, type people would write um, on bones, um, turtle, I know turtle shells, um, other types of bones, and they would write. Uh, something on them and oftentimes what they do is like a almost like a question or something something that you want to know and you put it on the bone an interesting thing that they would do is they would get these bones and then they put them in a fire now the heat causes the bones to expand and they start to crack and the way that it cracks i don't exactly know how they they read it but in the way it cracks gives a certain response to that question so it's an interesting thing that some of the earliest writing we have is is done on that now if they wrote on paper and things you know they are on other types of uh biodegradable things uh, it's very well you know that, that that was possible however those things don't store over time very well and something like a bone um, preserves way better and why we probably find these not that the only writing they ever did was on these bones but it's the stuff that has preserved uh, uh, most well and the stuff we find the most of so interesting little thing there about some of the early writing you can see they're kind of bring it up and they didn't really talk about it but i think that's such a neat part of history but then the leaders got corrupt and were replaced by the Zhou, who liked the iron and philosophy. But that one sort of just fell apart and was replaced by the Qin, who liked building walls and people made out of There's rock. Your first but they were pretty right tyrannical there. from the start and were quickly replaced by the Han, who liked creating new trade routes and getting in touch with their emotions. Ancient Chinese In line with this pattern, the Han dynasty came way, about under the like strong and popular leadership under of Emperor Gao Zhu. The dynasty really remained kind of firmly in place know. for over four centuries and was considered a golden age in Chinese history, developing new forms of art 
political thinking, use that word. technology. Oh, looks like all the leaders got corrupt. Yep. See, probably the biggest problem in ancient China's political system that allowed so much corruption to come about all the time was a little something called court culture. Let me explain. Imagine for me, if you will, that you are the son of the Chinese emperor. Hooray! Now, apart from how weird it is that you have a ton of stepmoms and many of them would like to kill you, and also all of your friends are middle-aged dudes with no dongs, life's pretty <laughs> alright. Yeah, One day, your father says, Always get asked by students. So all of your friends are middle Eunuchs. Why do they do this? Um, a eunuch is a male that had been castrated, and they are very, very prominent in Chinese history. They take a lot of powerful positions. And the question comes up in the classroom, why? Why would you do this to these people? Well, if you have been a person that is castrated, there are obviously things you are not going to be able to uh, do in your life. And one of those, of course, is have children. So this eliminates a reason of why someone might overthrow somebody else. Because they're not going to be able to start their own dynasty because they're not going to have any children. So it's like eunuchs are people that could be trusted. And they would be, again, be put in high positions of government probably for that reason. So interesting how it makes a sense in a way. Um, interesting, again, that that was... a. Uh, Actually, a long um, kind of like uh, thing that happened for a, for for a long time is the use of eunuchs in positions of power. So, I'm uh, not sure if that was something you were thinking you were going to learn about today, but uh, there you go. Age dudes. So history no is life's pretty all right. One day, your father says, "Son, I know our relationship hasn't been the best, and I've never said this before, but I just want to let you know that I love you." Oh no, I'm having a heart attack. Now you got young. Look at kid. you. Now you're the emperor. Yeah, but you're too young. I'm so proud of you. But wait, you are but a child and have no idea how to rule over a massive right. empire. Fret not, because just about everyone in your court wants to help you out with that. Yeah. Hey man, remember me? I'm your mom's bro. Anyway, I heard you needed someone to rule over China for you. I mean, to help you rule China. Until so, you hey, get old, here's right? here's a popsicle. I hope we can get along. <laughs> no way, man. We've been your friends and your personal caretakers your whole life. And even though we may have no dongs, I think you should give us all the power to rule China. I mean, help you rule China. So who will you be influenced by? Your scheming uncle or your loyal eunuchs? And towards the end of the Han Dynasty, a string of child emperors allowed more and more power to fall into the hands of the eunuchs. Oh no, now they're scheming too. They began handing out government jobs for bribes, heavily taxing the poor for their own wealth. And while you're sitting there eating your popsicle, everyone in your court is literally murdering each other to try and consolidate more power and riches for themselves. While all the peasants are outside like, hey, did you guys know there's been a drought out here for two years? No one's paying attention to Guys, the problems. Obviously, the people weren't too happy that while they were struggling to survive, they were also being heavily taxed so that the eunuch faction could all have rockin' mansions, complete with swimming pools and elections. Heavy taxes for so luxurious finally, lifestyles. So when a self-proclaimed Taoist wizard came along and was like, you know whose fault it is that we're all out here starving? It's the emperor and his posse. They've lost their mandate from heaven, and the imperial family must be destroyed with an unrelenting, furious wrath. Also, check this out. Huh? Can you tell what it is yet? Ta-da! It's a little kitty cat. Okay, they did not discuss it's like, what the mandate of heaven is. That we're all out here starving? It's the emperor and his posse. The They've lost their right mandate. Okay, so Chinese, China's history is, is often seen as cyclical in a way. Um, you have these, uh, it's called the dynastic cycle. R uh, rule for most of Chinese history has been in dynasties, right? These families that um, they're, they'll rule for hundreds of years. Um, but there's this kind of thing, and it, and it goes way back to um, at least the Zhou dynasty, which was the second or third, depending on how you want to order it. Um, but they, I believe, were the ones that kind of invented the idea, uh, which was this. It's like a, the ruler of China, the emperor, has a divine right to rule, right? A mandate, like the right, or like the the permission. I shouldn't say name, even right, but like the permission to rule. And that it comes from kind of a higher source. And uh, But that permission to rule is something that you can lose, okay? Um, one of the compare or contrasts that uh, I do in my class is with ancient Egypt, right? Um, comparison being that you have this kind of divine right to rule. And that is very powerful because if you believe somebody has a divine right to rule, like in Egypt, that they're uh, kind of blessed by the gods or even a God themselves, uh, that 
that kind of justifies your power. And if you can get, I guess, people to believe that you have some kind of divine inspiration to rule, you probably have a um, stronger rule because you're probably less likely to overthrow or something, a person that you believe is kind of ordained by the gods or something like that. But one of the differences, though, in in uh, in in Egypt, you can't you don't lose that right. You're basically a god. The Chinese never really felt their emperor was a deity, okay, an actual sort of god, but had sort of a divine right to rule. But you could lose that right to rule. Now, how do you lose it? You don't act properly. And again, this goes back to uh, the Zhou Dynasty, who overthrew the Shang before them, and talked about how the 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 corruption and there's all kinds of crazy stories about like potential cannibalism or something that the shang were up to and it would be like uh and and because of that um you lose the right to 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 rule you lose that the mandate of heaven now how do you know somebody has lost the mandate of heaven it's not like some letter is sent down to the people saying the emperor has lost the right to rule no this is where they actually interesting will interestingly will tie a lot of um, natural disasters and things like that to this. So if your ruler is being corrupt, they are being neglectful, um, immoral, something like that, you are, they believe natural disasters are going to be one of the signs potentially of that earthquakes, the flooding of the river. Like they started out the very beginning, the yellow river and other rivers of China that are prone to very nasty floods. And so they saw those almost as signs that they ha you had lost the mandate of heaven. There are other forces too. It wasn't just uh, like uh, physical disasters. If the um, area starts to see more crime, bandits are running across the trade routes or foreigners and the nomads right from the north are coming in. These are all signs that you've lost the mandate of heaven. And when that happens, it's like, somebody can come to claim it now how do you claim that uh, you have to act like the benevolent benevolent person that um that is is justified in having the mandate of heaven if this makes sense so uh, i believe it's the zhou that kind of invented it for a way to justify their overthrow of the shang and then that just kept kept happening that that dynasty would lose their power and then somebody else would come to claim it and would feel justified in doing that so important concept that drove in a way the dynastic cycle which has been the 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 kind of like governing force in a way or describing the governing force for china for millennia actually um so anyway uh, they only went over that but that's a huge part of chinese history that everyone needs to know mandate from heaven and the imperial family must be destroyed with an unrelenting furious wrath well so check this out huh <laughs> can you tell what it is yet Ta-da! it's a little kitty cat Look at her little ears. The people loved his political philosophy. He promised them land reforms, and his followers grew in number. They began arming themselves and wearing yellow turbans. And they also developed a really yellow catchy turban slogan. Yep. In the year 184, the Yellow Turban Rebellion broke out across China, with millions rising up against the Han Dynasty. And the imperial government in the capital city freaked out. With all their internal bickering, they were completely unprepared and unable to deal with such a huge rebellion. So they were forced to call Peasant on independent warlords enormous. from across the empire to help them deal with this situation. Some big names took part in the fighting. I'm talking the likes of the great Cao Cao, the tyrannical Dong Zhou, Liu Bei, Sun Jian, and many, many other Chinese names I'm definitely Power not pronouncing. Everyone's trying to fill These it. warlords crushed the rebellion in their own respective regions. And with casualties in the millions, the Han Dynasty breathed a huge sigh of relief. But what they didn't realize is that by relying on all the warlords and their armies, they had essentially diminished their own central yep, control over the empire. Control. And many of the warlords now held the power to act almost completely independently and rule over their own local regions themselves. Back in the capital, the emperor and his son were having a little chat. Listen, I know we've had our ups and downs, and I spend all of my time with your many, many smoking hot stepmoms instead of you. But what say you and I finally go on a little fishing trip together this weekend? Oh no, I'm having a stroke! And yet another child emperor was on the... <laughs> As somebody gets assassinated in the ad here. The throne. This Good time, job, however, <laughs> instead of the eunuch faction gaining even more power, this child emperor's uncle became his regent, who also just so happened to be the head of the imperial army, Hu Jin. Man, I hate those sneaky, lying, cheating eunuchs. Hey, warlord Yuan Shao, what should we do? Kill them all. Wow. Well. 
Right on. Right. You can't kill the eunuchs. They're a Escalated vital part of this quickly. empire's governance. Empress Dowager, yeah. A lot of money to say Mom. That about them. Um, Dowagers are a big part of history again, where you have the child who um, is too young to rule. It's techni technically the emperor. Um, and the mother would kind of be in control in a way and basically take care of his affairs, uh, supposedly until the son becomes of what they believed was a mature enough age to actually rule. So, yeah, these powerful mothers um, rule China for parts of history. Come on. No. So Hu Jin and Yuan Shao decided the Empress may need more convincing. And so they called in an infamous, feared, tyrannical, overweight warlord from the Northwest to help convince her. That man was <laughs> Dong Zhou, and he set out Convince. for the capital city with his army. Hey guys, I heard a rumor that Hu Jin was planning on killing us. Then why don't we kill him first? And so it was. They lured him to the palace with a forged letter from his sister, and we Hold well, on, let's, let's go ahead and read the note, Kill right? him first. And so it was. They lured him to the- Hey, Hu, uh, I need your help with something unspecified. And not at all suspicious, this letter isn't a forgery from your sis, the Empress Dowager. Palace with a forged letter from his sister, and when he got there, they lobbed off his head. Yikes. Kill them all. Imperial forces stormed the palace, and the eunuchs were all massacred. The peasants, who were uh -oh. still suffering from drought and starvation, saw what was going on, and began to riot. The emperor and his brother were forced to flee the city, which was now in flames. And the feared, nasty, tyrannical, bloated Dong Zhou had just arrived. He found the emperor and his brother wandering the hills outside of the city and was understandably confused. So he scooped up the emperor, went to the capital and was like, hey guys, what's up? I see the capital is on fire. Also, I'm here with my army and I have the emperor with me. Wait a minute. The capital is on fire. I'm here with my army <laughs> and I have the emperor. Screw you guys. Yep. I'm in charge. Yep. So now Dong Zhou is the Han Dynasty as the emperor's regent. His first act was to say to the emperor, "Hey man, no hard feelings, but I like your little brother better. So I'm actually making him emperor instead of you. So you're free to go do whatever you want." Actually, no. Nope. Yeah. Yeah. That feels better. Dong Zhou ruled with an iron fist, and he did whatever the flip he wanted. He made absolute decisions himself, showing no regard for the monarchy. He had his opponents or those who disagreed with him killed. He broke protocol, doing things like keeping his sword when approaching the emperor, wearing Don't shoes do that. in the court, oh, sleeping shoes? in the emperor's bed, and worst of all, he would walk in the presence of the emperor. You were meant to trot. The other warlords around the empire hated him, and so they said, Something needs to be done about this guy. What say we form a coalition and oust him? And it was agreed. Warlords from across China, their armies amounting yeah, to 100,000 like men, allied together against the tyranny of Dong Zhou. Yuan Shao's coalition consisted of some of the nation's most capable leaders, including his half-brother Yuan Shu, the great Cao Cao, and Sun Jian. But Dong Zhou had an ace up his sleeve, his protege and adopted son, one of the most skilled and feared warriors in all of China. It's Lu Bu. This guy was a beast of a man. He never lost a duel, and no other warlord dared challenge him to one. He was also famous for betraying just about every warlord he ever fought for, something that Dong Zhou didn't seem too concerned about. The coalition attacked Dong Zhou in Luoyang, and in particular, Sun Jian's forces inflicted a heavy defeat against him, and he was forced to flee to the city of Chang'an. After this initial success, however, the war the entered into a stalemate. The warlords in the coalition realized it was going nowhere, and also they all secretly hated each other. So they all went home. Dong Zhou was safe. Until. Legend has it that a government official in Chang'an had a daughter who was hot. Super hot. He invited Lu Bu to his home, and promised Lu Bu that someday he could marry his daughter. Then, he invited Dong Zhou to his house and did the exact same thing. Uh -oh. Dong Zhou was so smitten that he insisted on taking her as his concubine immediately. And when Lu Bu heard the news, he was pretty Bad unhappy. Decision. Hey man, aren't you worried that you stole Lu Bu's girl and betrayal is like his personal hobby? Lu Bu, betray me? No way, man. Never gonna happen. Yeah, there you go. Now you have no oh, problem crap. doing that. Lu Bu, along with other government officials, assassinated the tyrannical Dong Zhou. Then they left his body burning in the streets. Ooh. Some sources say he was so fat and oily, he kept on burning for days. <laughs> Wait, was that a marshmallow? To go back to that. Nice. Some sources say he was so fat and oily, <laughs> he kept on burning for days. Nice. So with Dong Zhou dead, and the power of the Han government essentially decimated, 
China was left with a huge power gap and a ton of warlords who all slept soundly at night dreaming of being the one to fill it. Here we enter into a crazy and chaotic period of civil war all across China with so many people, so much betrayal, so much intricacy, it makes Game of Thrones look like a Dr. Seuss publication. <laughs> but just to give you an idea of how crazy and chaotic it was, see if you're able to keep up with this. Are you ready? All right. Here we go. Here we go. Let's Here's try a it. rough map of the warlords throughout the Han Dynasty at the time. Half brothers Yuan Shao and Yuan Shu were both in a power struggle for who would become the figurehead of their family. Yuan Shu made alliances with warlords in the north, along with Sun Jian, the guy who defeated Dong Zhou. Yuan Shao also made alliances with Liu Biao in the south and Cao Cao, who was an amazing strategist and general. All of these warlords began fighting each other. Cao Cao began building his own strength by subjugating nearby remnants of the Yellow Turban Rebellion into his own forces. Down south, things weren't going so well for Sun Jian as he was killed in an ambush. So Sun 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 Se took over. Then Yuan Shu got pushed back to the river Huai, so he ordered Sun Se to take the territory of warlord Liu Kang. Then Sun Se went off to capture territory the history the for himself. The Cao Cao's family lived in this province over here. Over One day, they were murdered. Oh no, Cao Cao held the province hard to governor get that kind of responsible. Information. And so he launched a cruel invasion in which he pillaged cities and murdered over 100,000 civilians. The governor sent out a call for help, and a very popular, likable warlord by the name of Liu Bei came to his aid. However, while Cao Cao was away fighting, a rebellion was staged against him in his home province by none other than it's Liu Bu. Cao Cao He's rushed back. home and defeated Liu Bu, who fled to the east, which by now had been inherited by Liu Bei. Then Liu Bu, surprise, surprise, launched a rebellion against Liu Bei who fled to Cao Cao. Yeah, Together, all Cao Cao and Liu Bei would go on to invade and defeat Liu There'll Bu. Be a quiz at the Liu end Bu of the offered video. to join Cao Cao, and Cao Cao considered the offer. But his advisors were like, no way, man. This guy's betrayed literally everyone he ever worked for. And so Bu Hu, Liu Bu, was executed. <laughs> Next, Cao Cao convinced the emperor to move in with him. Now he's in control of the Han government, something that made his allies very jealous. Yuan Shu, out of nowhere, decides to declare himself emperor of the new Zhang dynasty. Nobody liked that. His allies cut ties with him. The imperial government ordered everyone to kill him. He tried to flee to his brother Yuan Shao, but died of illness on the way. Sun Se took over his territory and then got assassinated. So his brother, Sun Chen, took over. Liu Bei turned on Cao Cao, but got obliterated and was forced to flee south. Yuan Shao finally defeated the warlord to his north and could now focus south. He declared war on his ally Cao Cao, but was defeated at the Battle of Guandu. Cao Cao has now united the north, and he turned his attention to the south. In particular, Liu Biao's province was becoming a powerful threat, so Cao Cao attacked him. Liu Bei was now fighting for Liu Biao, and he held Cao Cao off for a while. But then Liu Biao died, and his son took over, and immediately surrendered to Cao Cao. Liu Bei was horrified, and he fled southward to try and maintain control of the province. Cao Cao was on an absolute roll, and it looked like he would be the one to take control of China. He began making plans to attack both Liu Bei and Sun Qian, and the two of them, seeing where things were headed, met up and decided to form an alliance. Now I know that was a lot to take in, but all you what really that, need to know at this point is that this guy is on his way to taking over everything, and he's about to throw his full weight at the southern warlords. These two have one chance, one battle, to prevent him These from invading kingdoms? the south. And that battle was the famous Battle of Red Cliffs. To take mm. the south, Cao Cao would need to control and Heard cross this. the mighty Yangtze River. He had over 200,000 men to face against Liu Bei and Sun Qian's combined force of 50,000. How would they stand a chance when they were so outnumbered? Left. Legend says <laughs> most of Sun Qian's advisors pleaded with him to surrender, but then he smashed up a table and they all backed down. Luckily, Cao Cao's forces were ravaged by disease and exhaustion, oh. and his northern soldiers weren't too comfortable on ships. So when Cao Cao Bad sailed luck. down the river and the two sides met for an initial skirmish at Wulin, Cao Cao was unable to inflict a defeat against the allies. Then one of Sun Qian's men came up with a very sneaky plan. He sent Cao Cao a letter, pretending that he and others wanted to defect <laughs> to his side, and offered to bring him some of Liu Bei and Sun Qian's finest ships. Little did Cao Cao know, however, that those ships were full of flammable reeds. As they approached his fleet, they were set alight and destroyed his ships in camp. Seeing the situation as hopeless, Cao Cao ordered a, a difficult like, uh, retreat through the rain and marshlands, Persian during which more Greece. of his men fell to illness and disease. The underdogs had won, and Cao Cao would never again have another chance to take the south. Following that, the three warlords took some time to finish off some smaller competitors in their own regions. And by the year 214, China looked a little bit like this. Cao Cao continued to try to penetrate the southern regions, 
but had no success and even lost the Hanjian region to Liu Bei in 217. The former allies eventually fell out over who should own this territory here, with Sun Qian coming out on top. In 220, Cao Cao died of a head disease and was replaced by his son, head? Cao Pi. Cao Pi convinced the Emperor of Han to abdicate and then proclaimed himself the Emperor of the new state of Wei. Liu Bei followed suit, declaring himself the true Emperor of Shu Han. And a few years later, Sun Qian joined in the fun and declared himself Emperor of Wu. And so now you have a number of kingdoms in China. How many? Count them. There One, two, three. Three kingdoms. Except, actually, they weren't kingdoms, pretty balanced. they were dynasties. And when the three kingdoms finally formed, not a Are whole lot happened. Semantics For here, the though? next three decades, oh. they continued to engage in combat, but it almost always ended in stalemate, and nobody really got anywhere. So how did it all end? Did Cao Cao's descendants eventually realize his dream of unifying China? Not quite. Instead, the three kingdoms became victims of the usual problems that plagued Chinese dynasties. In Wu, Sun Qian's descendant became a tyrant, who was more interested in spending time with his concubines than governing. In Shu Han, mm -hmm. a powerful, corrupt eunuch faction rose up. And by oh, now we all know how that the ends. And in Wei, a string of young emperors gave way to for a powerful family, the Sima clan, to take control of the dynasty's government. This Sima clan recognized the weak state Shu and Wu had been reduced to, and so they began making plans. I've just received this letter that says Wei is planning to attack us. Should we make preparations for war? Nah, it's probably nothing to worry about. Let's do absolutely nothing. Uh-oh. Sounds good to me. Wei uh -oh. launched a full-scale invasion into Shu, which oh, fell within goodbye, a year. Shu then Sima Yan forced the Wei Emperor to abdicate and proclaimed himself Emperor of the new Jin Dynasty. In the year 279, mm. Jin launched an invasion of Wu and finally unified China in the year 280. The pattern of rising and falling dynasties, division and reunification would continue in China for centuries oh, yeah. to come. Sure. Right now you may be asking yourself, but wait a minute, what would have happened if Cao Cao had his way and unified China? Or what if Lu Bu never assassinated Dong Zhou yeah, and he countless continued to rule over the Han I mean, Dynasty? What about if one of these smaller warlords had risen to the top? Dang it, is. what if I want to be a warlord during the downfall of the Han Dynasty? Whoa, partner, calm down, because now you can. This video was brought to you Played by Total the game, War right? Three Kingdoms, a brand new strategy game that combines a gripping turn-based campaign of empire building, statecraft, and Total War games. I've never played them, with but... stunning real-time battles. Choose from a cast of I love, legendary like, warlords video and game. conquer Civilization. the realm. Unite China um, under your rule. I like those games a lot. Forge the next great dynasty and build a legacy that will last through the ages. Recruit Just heroic tell me characters in comments. to aid your cause and How are the Total War games? Enemies. You played them? On military, technological, political, and economic fronts. Will you build powerful friendships, play, like, form the brotherly alliances, games? and earn the respect of your many foes? Or, like the, like, or would you rather uh, commit acts of researching treachery, heart technologies and kind of growing a master the time? That's of grand something I've always liked about I bet you would. Your legend is yet to be written. Probably more but focused one thing on the is warfare, certain. though. Glorious conquest awaits. Buy the game on Steam using my link in the description down below. It would also support my channel and my work massively. If you're into that, be sure to support so them. thank you. Get a deal, maybe, or whatever. Honey is a free browser add-on. All right, <laughs> all right. Um, great video, um, great video. Such, I mean, it was hard to keep up with with so many of those those different things. I know when the the Han fell, that was one of the most violent times like in world history. Uh, and now they show a little bit of detail why, because there's so much power grabbing going on, and you see just that common thing of history about warlords coming to power when a large entity like the han dynasty um falls you know it, it creates a power vacuum right and people since i don't have like a, a national entity if you want to look at it that way of someone to protect you and create stability you tend to find yourself looking for someone locally that can do those things uh, reminds me a little bit of like the fall of the roman empire that happened too when rome fell you became somebody that was uh it was necessarily more important to get somebody locally and you are loyal to them because they can protect you. And in a time of violence, like the fall of Rome or the fall of the Han dynasty, you need that. Otherwise you're not going to survive. You're not going to be able to protect yourself unless you have somebody that can sort of do that. So you create that relationship of loyalty to that Lord warlord, whatever it is they want to call themselves. And it's a symbiotic relationship that way. And that's uh, basically what feudalism is, you know, and it happens all over the world. Um, and it's not just ancient either, even governing more, more common times. Um, it's just who can protect you, right? And if you can protect someone, then um, they're going to be loyal to you. So you have that relationship there. 
you could see that happening but it's not the last time this is going to happen in chinese history this fall of dynasties like we we talked about with our little talk there on the dynastic cycle is going to be a major feature of chinese history for all of china so anyways look into that more definitely if you're into more uh of the chinese history and looking into some of these dynasties um a lot of them will bring in some kind of uh, new technology or new kind of advancement but you will see in china one thing we we talk about in my classes is how things uh, stay the same or they change, right? We call it continuity and change over time. And in China, you get a lot of that, of things that stay the same. Um, like a lot of these times you get like Confucianism, which will permeate throughout dynasties. Um, um, but then you'll get some that like will go back on that and not want to uh, um, follow those ways, the uh, Confucian teachings and things like that. So interesting thing in history, you always it's good to understand that is understand how things change and how things stay the same. And uh, that's a, a good critical thinking skill, um, especially when you're looking at history. So, well, that was great. Um, a lot of stuff I learned there of a little bit more of the intricate details and things like that. It's amazing that there is a history as detailed as I'm assuming they were able to go into there. But that's great. So, all right. Um, once again, give them a view i'll leave a link to the oversimplified video the original one so you can check that out and make sure that you um, give them support uh, if you have video suggestions um, leave them i'm getting them a lot more and more as the channel seems to be getting popular and i really really just thank everybody that's um, given comments and has subscribed and give the likes um, this is this channel is growing way more than i i thought i didn't know there would be such a good market um or I guess out there for hopefully hearing not just a react video because there's so many react videos but hopefully you know you get an extra little dose from the historical perspective um, from a history teacher so um, I just really appreciate all of you that have done that and have continued on and given given me such nice feedback and if you have any feedback that's great um, love to hear it but I'm having a lot of fun doing these I definitely want to do more and thanks to oversimplified which has been the video source for so many of my videos here and I um, want to branch out more and uh, do other content creators um, for sure but it's the internet and it's just full of an infinite amount of just amazing things to to talk about so once again thank you for checking out my video I'm Mr. Terry hope to see you back for future videos have a great day